This is a story about Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, the only woman to ever be awarded the United States Congressional Medal of Honor. She lived during the Civil War, and as famous as she was during those times, her story is rarely told today. A woman surgeon in the Union Army who is not disguised as a man? How did that happen? Mary Edwards Walker was born on November 26, 1832. She was the youngest of five daughters, and she also had a younger brother. The family lived on a farm in Oswego Town, New York, on the shores of Lake Ontario. Her parents were free thinkers. They were progressive and ardent abolitionists, even using their home as a stop on the Underground Railroad. Over the years, her father had amassed many books on health, and as a teenager, Mary's intellectual curiosity just gobbled them all up. Eclectic medicine was widespread in that area. It differed from allopathic medicine by promoting hydrotherapy over drug-based medical treatments and focused on preventative care and hygiene. By 16, Mary knew she wanted to be a doctor. She also knew from personal experience that the way females dressed in the mid-1800s was all wrong. Mary and her sisters toiled in the fields of their farm, and wearing long skirts and tight corsets was impractical. Tight corsets, her father suggested, were also bad for the internal organs, and Mary questioned the poor hygiene that resulted from the long skirts that dragged in the mud on the streets. But more importantly, she realized keeping women in tight corsets and long dresses only reinforced the power dynamics. Men, figuratively and literally, wore the pants. So from then on, she championed dress reform in three ways. One, by shortening her own dresses and wearing pants underneath— This was eventually called the bloomer costume. Two, by writing many articles for The Sybil, the official publication of the Dress Reform Association. And three, by being active in the leadership roles of women's rights groups. In 1851, at the age of 19, Mary had learned everything she could have from her parents' free school in the backyard. So she attended Fally Seminary in Fulton, New York, where its curriculum neatly dovetailed with the eclectic medicine movement and the education and values she received back home in Oswego. In 1853, with great support from her father, she entered Syracuse Medical School. Elizabeth Blackwell was the first woman to graduate with a medical degree in the United States. Mary was the second. After graduating, she married Albert Miller, a fellow student in her same medical program, and the two doctors set up separate practices next door to each other in Rome, New York. But by late 1859, she learned that her husband had repeatedly been unfaithful, so she demanded a divorce. Divorce in those days was scandalous and hard to come by, and it took Mary over nine years to finalize it. In 1861, with her marriage pretty much over, she closed up her medical practice and boarded a train for Washington, D.C. Mary's arduous journey during the Civil War required tenacity as she struggled to be accepted and compensated in the same manner as her male counterparts in the medical field. Mary Walker arrived in Washington, D.C. two months after the Confederacy walloped the Union Army in the Battle of Bill Run. Troop movement in and out of the Capitol was swelling. She presented herself to the War Department, which it wasn't all that unusual at that time. If you could afford the journey to get to Washington, D.C., you expected to be seen, even by the president. Well, at the time, in 1861, there were only 30 surgeons that belonged to the Union Army. Lincoln soon required that every time a new volunteer regiment of soldiers organized in any state, its governor had to appoint a surgeon and an assistant surgeon. In September 1861, she made her proposal for service in Simon Cameron's office. She told the Secretary of War she wanted a commission as a physician in the United States Army. But he refused, affirming that gender power structure in place. And he did not like the way she dressed. But it didn't dissuade her. 
Weeks after the start of the Civil War, President Lincoln named Clement Finley Surgeon General of the Army. Mary went to his office and appealed to serve. Finley turned her down. So she moved down the chain of command to Assistant Surgeon General Robert C. Wood. Wood had no objection, but he said he wouldn't go over Finley's head. This at least gave Mary hope. A makeshift hospital was created on the second floor of the U.S. Patent Office in Washington, D.C. She selected this facility because she had heard that the head surgeon, Dr. J.N. Green, desperately needed an assistant, so she volunteered her services there. With no commission in sight, she enrolled in the Hygiotherapeutic College in New York City in 1862 to further her education of eclectic methods, ones the Army thought were no better than quackery. I mean, the medical board was really just made up of allopathic doctors. Still, her experience with the eclectic school and their emphasis on hygiene and cleanliness were right on track to save many soldiers from deadly infections, especially after amputations. Graduating in April of 1862 and armed with enhanced credentials, Mary set off to find another way to secure a military commission. Despite her best efforts, she was unable to prove her worth in the Washington, D.C. military hospitals. So she concluded she would go to the front. In late 1862, General George McClellan was replaced with General Ambrose Burnside. Within a week of his appointment, Burnside led 120,000 soldiers toward Richmond to capture the Confederate capital. Mary joined his forces at Warrenton, located 21 miles west of Manassas. The officer in charge was so overwhelmed by the number of sick and injured men lying about the floor that he told Mary to do what she could to help them. She sprang into action and reported her findings to the top man at the camp, General Burnside. This time, the top brass did not wave her away, but instead, Burnside dictated an order, which authorized Mary to accompany the injured men to Washington, D.C. The train was held up, and it was Mary who gave the order to the engineer to continue on, exerting her authority as the military conductor of the train. Shortly after, Mary volunteered at Lacey House, an old plantation in Falmouth, a behind-the-lines station where soldiers received treatment before being sent on to Washington, D.C., and where Burnside waited with his men before his march on to Richmond. On December 13, 1862, the day of the Battle of Fredericksburg, there were over 13,000 Union casualties and 500 wounded men who would undergo amputations. Mary's surgical skills were put to good use. The poet Walt Whitman arrived on December 21st in search of his brother George, only to document the horrific scene of arms and legs piled up in the garden. Though the Army did not pay Mary, they did give her daily rations and a tent assignment, and she fashioned a green surgeon's sash to her outfit, even though she had no government authority to do so. Striving for equality in the medical field was not all that Mary concentrated on. She also led a pioneering fight for equality in general. 1863 was a busy year for Mary. Lincoln had just signed the Emancipation Proclamation, and Mary spent her time between Washington, D.C. and the field. By this time, Burnside had given Mary his tacit approval, making it easier for her to secure travel passes through Virginia and other forward locations. Many men, like Republican Senator Preston King of New York, tried to intervene on her behalf to get her that commission with the Army. But again, the Secretary of War's office replied that no authority of law existed for doing so. So Mary stayed with the Army of the Potomac. She was so popular, newspapers wrote about her in the field, and she was so well known that her name was added to the annual spring reception at the executive mansion where she met President Lincoln and his wife. She also got involved with legal matters of soldiers in prison, even appearing in court on their behalf. Mary also helped create the Invalid Corps, a place for disabled soldiers who did not want to return home to continue to serve in some capacity. And while in D.C., Mary found another wrong to be put right. Women from all over traveled to D.C., mostly looking for their husbands in hospitals. But if they were alone, they were suspect of prostitution. Unless visiting women had friends or family to stay with, they could not find a reputable place to stay the night. So Mary founded a home for these women to stay safely in. She immersed herself in women-led organizations. 
She made a success of Women's Relief Association and the Women's Loyal National League. This one linked emancipation with women's rights. During the fall of 1863, she extended her field work beyond Virginia and into Tennessee, where she worked as a surgeon in the Army of the Cumberland under General George Thomas. But still, she was not being paid for her services. On November 2nd, 1863, she once again wrote to Stanton, Secretary of War, and tried a different tact. She proposed he give her authority to set up a regiment of men to be called Walker's U.S. Patriots. But once again, she was denied. Learning of Stanton's rejection to her raising a regiment, she went over his head and wrote Lincoln directly on January 11th. Lincoln replied, quote, I am willing, end quote, but then more undesirable qualifiers after that. So in February of 1864, she traveled to Chattanooga, where General George Thomas had never forgotten Mary's work in Tennessee. He recommended she replace Dr. Rosa, who died earlier in 1864, as assistant surgeon to the 52nd Ohio Volunteers. In early March, she had to undergo a medical examination test and face the medical board of these regular or allopathic doctors. Well, they were overtly prejudiced against the eclectic method of practice and eventually stated that the only position suitable for her was a nurse. But she refused to be hired as a nurse. General Thomas overruled the medical board's decision on March 10, 1864. Instead of military status, though, she was offered a contract civilian assistant surgeon position, roughly equal to the rank of lieutenant. Mary earned $80 a month, and the Army supplied her a horse and a saddle. She wore a uniform of her own design, a bloomer outfit in navy, with the green sash identifying her as a surgeon. Once in his absence, General Edward McCook, who headed up the 52nd Ohio Volunteers, ordered Mary to don the red sash for officer of the day, and she carried out a review of the troops, the only instance in the war where a woman did this. When it was slow around camp, McCook encouraged, well, really ordered, Mary to go into Confederate territory to treat local civilians. The doctor took these risks not only to help people in need, but to assist the Union military as well. As a woman and a physician, her ability to easily travel back and forth between enemy lines provided good opportunities for intelligence gathering. Back in 1862, she wrote to Alan Pinkerton's Secret Service Agency to volunteer her services. She had raised the possibility again in the summer of 1863. Finally, in 1864, General George Thomas approved. Intelligence was vital in the summer of 1864, as General William Tecumseh Sherman prepared his Atlanta campaign. He needed information about Confederate activities throughout Georgia, and it is believed that Mary supplied him with some very valuable information. On her way back to Lee and Gordon's Mill on April 10, 1864, After boldly crossing enemy lines to treat wounded civilians, Dr. Walker was captured by Confederate soldiers and was arrested as a spy. Benedict J. Sims, a captain in the depot commissary at Dalton, witnessed the doctor's arrival. He noted her uniform and pronounced her fair but not good-looking and, of course, had tongue enough for a regiment of men. She was ordered to Castle Thunder Prison. The prison was designed to hold 1,400, but it swelled to 3,000. Conditions were awful. Mary went hungry, battled bugs, bad nutrition, and had damage done to her eyes from the gas lights. Four months later, on August 9, 1864, a prisoner swap meant Mary was free. She became the first woman officer ever exchanged as a prisoner of war for a man of the same rank. When she returned to D.C., she was given five months back pay for her time at Lee and Gordon's Mill and for her time at Castle Thunder Prison. It amounted to a little over $430.
After two weeks in D.C., Mary made her way to Louisville, Kentucky, where, in September of that same year, she wrote to General Sherman asking for a commission again. He responded with only a paid appointment, not a commission, as surgeon for female prisoners and female refugees in Louisville. But by spring of 1865, Mary requested a transfer to the front, so she headed to Nashville, Tennessee in the end of March. But by April 9th, Lee's army surrendered, and Mary was transferred again to a refugee hospital in Clarksville. Soon after, Lincoln was assassinated. By May, the numbers at the hospital dwindled, and she received orders to report back to D.C., where, at her own request, the army terminated her contract on June 15, 1865. At the end of August, after receiving testimonials about Mary's accomplishments— President Johnson asked the Secretary of War to find out if there was any way in which recognition could be made of the doctor's wartime service. Letters came from Generals Sherman, Thomas, and McCook, who all testified to her important contributions, and Johnson also knew that Lincoln had wanted it. The National Republican of Washington, D.C. wrote, It is the only compensation under the law that the president is empowered to bestow upon the doctor because she happens to be a woman. Much of the service rendered to her, to the government, could have not been accomplished by a man. In the end, Attorney Joseph Holt, who served as the Commissioner of Ordnance, stressed that she was recognized for her sacrifices, her fearless energy under circumstances of peril, her endurance of hardship and imprisonment at the hands of the enemy, and especially her active patriotism and eminent loyalty. It was so singular that it could not have happened again, And therefore, it couldn't possibly set a precedence. So in November of 1865, Dr. Mary Edwards Walker became the first, and so far the only, woman to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor for meritorious service. After the war, Mary continued to advocate for women's rights and dress reform, refusing to wear restrictive women's clothing. In 1917, her Medal of Honor was one of 900 that the United States Army rescinded on a new requirement of mandatory active combat. But Mary refused to return it. She wore the medal every day of her life. She was one of the 1,522 Medal of Honors awarded for Civil War service, and she was the only female recipient, a fact that she would probably find disappointing today. Unfortunately, she did not live long enough to see women achieve suffrage. Both houses of Congress finally passed the 19th Amendment in the spring of 1919, a few months after she died. In 1977, her medal was reinstated, And in 1982, the United States Post Office Department issued a commemorative stamp in her likeness. But then, just eight short years later, in 1990, our memory of her fades again when Ken Burns releases his popular nine-segment, 11 and a half hours Civil War series. The documentary gives a nod to women nurses, but... As Brittany Mendez found in her research of the series, women speak less than 6% of the overall time. And when they did speak, it was usually to introduce a letter for the male story. It does not include a single word about Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, the Medal of Honor recipient, the only woman in history to receive the Medal of Honor. And sadly, she rarely shows up in any more than a footnote in modern history books. Yet her story shows us that Mary was indeed a trailblazer for for women in the medical field, women's rights, dress reform, enslaved people, disabled soldiers, and more. Her story should not be marginalized anymore. And you killed spring bean in a robbery Little did you know as you ran away your cash you at was stashed in clay Oh, poor string mean as you heard him say Oh, yeah, time to pull the break down 
Now I'm boss from the rest of his life Oh, life can change from the tap of your boots Well, some things are poor and others are home. 